this morning, so uh, welcome everyone as we continue our study on uh, God's will. And hopefully today we can kind of begin to wrap it up, I hope, uh, make some application, and then um, we can, we'll, we'll move on to a different topic. But uh, anyway, so as I recall, last week we left off, I think, in the middle of a riveting story of Kevin Kogus lost on the high seas off the coast of Alaska and a kayak, you know. It, we did, we did, and so, and, and uh, the story, as I recall, was, you know, we were talking about the providence of God, and as Christians, are we left alone in this world? Is there any help? Does God see us? Does he see, does he understand our needs and our cares, our desires? Can we pray to him? Does he listen to our prayers? Does he answer our prayers? And we, we were talking about God's providential answer to prayers. It was kind of interesting through the week hearing different people relate instances where uh, very possibly God was working providentially in their lives. And so that was kind of an encouraging thing to hear. But the reason we were talking about that is we were kind of trying to, uh, to see if we could come up with a succinct uh, distinction between those things that are miraculous and those things that were providential. And so I thought I would just look at uh, a couple of sources and just uh, 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 read uh, a few of the things that you know a lot of the smart people say, a lot of the people that study this kind of thing, and see if we could pull that together into a real succinct definition. And uh, as I recall, I just uh, uh, related part of an article from Wayne Jackson. And one of the things that, that he had said, I believe Dean kind of pointed to, uh, Wayne had said in his description of providence that God would not override the free will of man through his providential working. So if that is in fact the case, then how does that square with or align with a lot of the things that we had been talking about, about God's determinate will versus permissive will and how God works providentially in that realm of the permissive will? For example, if God from the beginning of time promised that he's going to do something, his determinate will, for example, I'm going to send my son to save the world. If he promised that, then another individual through their exercise of free will say, Herod says, I'm not going to let that happen. Who is going to win that battle of wills? And I suggest that God's always going to win that, right? If he promised it, it's going to happen. So if that is the case, how do these two ideas align? And I think if you go, at least in my case, when I went and I, and I go and I, I read uh, some of the examples given by, say, Wayne Jackson, Apologetic Press, and these other guys, it kind of depends. Your answer really depends on, number one, how you ask the question, and two, are you looking at the beginning of the equation or the end of the equation. Because one of the things that you find that seems to be a common distinction between that which is miraculous and that which is providential is a miraculous a action often happens instantaneously. Providential action happens over time, many times through many individuals. For example, when Jesus turned the water into wine, it happened instantaneously. When he raised Lazarus, he says, Lazarus, come forth. He comes forth. That's kind of an instantaneous thing. Providentially, oftentimes, God works over a long period of time. So if you go and look at the examples given by these guys, what you often see is that the examples typically illustrate a thwarting of the intended objective of the individual, not their ambition, nor their subsequent actions or decisions in an effort to accomplish that objective. Does that make sense? So are you looking at the beginning of the equation where someone has an ambition and they make a multiplicity of decisions over a long period of time and they exercise their free will or the end objective that they're trying to accomplish? And God says, no, you can exercise your free will, but you're not going to accomplish that end game, that end objective. So it kind of depends on how you're looking at the equation. So uh, I think a good example might be um, if you remember the story of Esther in the Bible. So and through that, you see a lot of things going on, but one of the main threads in that is you see Haman decides, I'm going to kill the Jews. That's his objective. That's what he wants to do through his exercise of free will. Now, how does God providentially work through that? You see this story unfold over a long period of time with many actors all exercising their free will. So, interestingly enough, the story starts out in chapter 1 with the king, Ahasuerus, having a party. How does a party 
play into this plot? Well, it does, because in that party, perhaps he has a little too much to drink, but he decides he wants to, of his own free will, ask the queen, Vashti, to come and parade herself before the group. And Vashti, apparently, through the exercise of her free will, says, no, not going to do it. The advisors of the king, through apparently their exercise of free will, say, okay, king, you can't let that go. If you let her get away with that, the women in the land are going to start thinking for themselves. You can't let that happen. We can't have that. You've got to stop that. You've got to depose her. So then there goes the queen. Now there's an empty spot, and the king has to say, okay, I need another individual to fill that role as queen. And it just so happens there's a beautiful young Israelite lady uh, named Esther that eventually comes to that role. And it just so happens that she's kin to a guy named Mordecai, who just so happens to be standing at the gate when uh, the gatekeepers begin to plot to kill the king. And he hears that, and he just so happens to think, you know what, I can go to, the, uh, uh, to some uh, judicial officials and tell them of that. And those officials take it seriously enough from this conquered person to actually investigate. And when they uh, investigate, they conclude that, yes, in fact, this is a plot to kill the king. And they execute the gatekeepers and record it in the records of the chronicles of the king. But evidently, Ahasuerus doesn't know it, isn't aware of it, or doesn't remember it. Right, so all of these things, through all of these actors, are playing together. Well, as you know, as the story unfolds, when Haman finally reaches the point where he, he's in the position, he has the power, and he has the plot to finally get rid of Mordecai and the Jews. He begins a trek to come and visit the king to enter his court. And as he's on the way, it just so happens that the king can't sleep that night. And he gets up, and he goes, and he finds the royal scribe, and he says, why don't you read me the records of what has happened recently in the kingdom. And as the read, in the reading of those records, he finds that Mordecai saved his life. And he says, what can be done for this man? How can I honor him? Is there anyone in the court that can tell me? And as he's uttering those words, guess who enters the court? Haman. King says, bring him here. Let me ask him what can be done for a man uh, uh, to whom the king wishes to honor. And that is sort of, the, sort of the, the, the critical point, the straw that breaks the camel's back, so to speak, that the rest of the story unfolds and Haman is eventually killed on the, the, uh, the gallows that he has erected for Mordecai. So, I mean, you think about that, you see all of these players exercising their free will over a long period of time, but the ultimate objective is, is thwarted. So you've got, you've got Haman, you've got Mordecai, you've got Vashti, you've got Esther, you've got the doorkeepers, you've got the judicial officials, the scribes, you've got all of these people over all of this time that God is working to accomplish his end. So that hopefully is a, an example to show God working providentially over a period of time with the characters in that large play all exercising their free will so their free will is not overridden, but the end objective, the execution of the Jews, was thwarted. Does that sort of make sense? Okay. Uh, so then let me give you just one more uh, example. This was from Apologetics Press on this definition, and then we'll kind of try to sum it all up. So an article from AP uh, talking about providence. You know, what is this? For the purposes of this discussion, we define providence as the way God orchestrates his will through natural law, this idea is contrasted with God's miraculous intervention in human affairs. A miracle, such as Jesus walking on the water, or God's empowering Moses to put his hand into his cloak and it become leprous, is a recognizable overriding of certain natural laws. God's providence, on the other hand, is seen in cases where God works through natural laws to accomplish his will. Okay, so just summarizing, then I suggest that sort of my rule of thumb that I work with is if you want to know something miraculous versus providential, for a miraculous action, if an objective third party would be compelled to conclude that the laws of nature had been overruled, that would be the definition of something miraculous. Providential would be through natural law. Wayne Jackson says through natural law versus independent of natural law. Apologetics Press says overriding natural law versus working through natural law. So that, in my mind, if you look at you know, what a lot of people that study this thing say, that's sort of the core. There's a lot of other things that will 
that they'll kind of uh, feather on as sort of layers, but the core seems to be working through natural law or outside independent overruling natural law. Does that sort of make sense? Take it or leave it for whatever that's worth. Perhaps that will help you um, as you uh, study the subject. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's, it's, the, it's the, the steering or changing of events at God's direction, but working through natural law so that if you're, a, if you're say, an atheist, you're going to look at it and say, nothing special there, as opposed to you've known this guy from birth that's been blind, and someone comes up and lays their hands on them, and then all of a sudden they see there's you know, something that an objective party would say, would say that's that's really different than the natural course of things. So what I'm trying to be uh, clear about saying is that God is definitely working and affecting things in many cases um, in answer to prayer on behalf of his children. But it is through natural law as opposed to um, sort of a miraculous outside of natural law. So when um, uh, the high priest's servant had his ear cut off in the garden. Jesus picks it up and puts it on. You know, no stitches needed. All bleeding stopped. That's sort of what I'm talking about. Didn't me? Elijah's prayer. That's a great example of uh, providential ac action. Contrasted to the miraculous action of fire coming down from heaven and the sacrifice being burned up, um, Elijah said, except by my word, when God tells me Rain is not going to come to this land. For three and a half years, it didn't rain. When God said it's time, Elijah goes and prays for rain, and you see a cloud come up, expand, and rainfall. So the guy walking on the beach, looking up, not seeing Elijah praying, is going to say, oh, that, that, that's kind of how storms happen. But we know, because it's revealed to us, that God said, go pray for rain. You pray for rain, the rain comes. So God working through natural law. Okay, I saved one more because he actually uses different terminology, and I thought it kind of interesting in that if we looked at sort of our journey over the last four or five weeks here, we've kind of, we kind of gone in this path. We started with looking at God's will, and as you examine the scriptures about uh, what God says about his will being executed on the earth, you see various aspects of God's will, we kind of concluded there must be this idea of permissive will, things that happen that God does not approve of nor determines, but he permits. If then that's the case, and we as Christians live in this world with much evil that can't be directed at us, does God answer our prayers in that regard? If he does, then there must be uh, some sort of area in which all of the things in the larger circle could happen to us, but because God is a good and loving God and cares for his people, only a subset is actually permitted because God is watching out for his people and caring for his prayers. Well, how would God work in that capacity today? Well, that must be through providence. So that's kind of our journey. So when I looked up um, just over the past couple of weeks as we were talking about this, what people say about providence and how uh, they define it, there was an interesting uh, discussion in Easton's Bible Dictionary. And what I thought was so interesting about it was uh, kind of in a little bit different fashion than most other people, he defined providence as God working through second causes, secondary causes. In other words, not directly uh, in a miraculous sense, but through secondary causes. However, it's kind of interesting. He starts with providence and says, okay, if there is such a thing as providence, then God is acting in this world providentially and restraining some of the things that could happen to you by his providence. Therefore, he is permitting some evil activity, but not all activity. He has a permissive will, and thus God has will. So we started from God's will and got here. Easton's Bible Dictionary starts here and actually traversed that path backward, which I thought was kind of interesting. So just a couple of sentences. Let me read from that uh, just because I thought it was fairly interesting working backwards. So, providence, according to Easton's Bible Dictionary, literally means foresight, 
but is generally used to denote God's preserving and governing of all things by means of second causes. God's providence extends to the natural world, natural world, the brute creation, and the affairs of men and of individuals. It also uh, it extends also to the free actions of men, therefore working through the free will of man, and sinful things as well as to their good actions. As regards to the sinful actions of men, they are represented as occurring by God's permission, his permissive will, uh, and as controlled and overruled for good. God does not cause or approve of sin, but only limits it. He restrains it. He overrules it for good. So he starts here and then works back that way, which I thought was kind of, kind of fascinating. All right, any questions there before we kind of probably beat that horse long enough? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, that, that's a good point. And, and I think in many cases, when we see God working providentially, it's through other people. And many times a cast of characters that it, it's not, on, it, it's really until after the fact, sometimes many years later, you look back and think, wow, perhaps God had a hand in that. I just didn't know it at the time. It's, it's bigger than me. God's working in more ways than I can see at one time. But I think it's definitely what the Bible suggests is that God does still work today and uh, we very much should be grateful for all of the wonderful things that he gives to us and provides for us. But David? Yeah, and I, th I think there's a definite relation in that for the, the Ethiopian eunuch and when we reference the uh, Amorites and that activity, um, the permissiveness is that God, God permits a person to exist in a state of rebellion, permits them to commit additional rebellious acts because the, the good person whom is that, that is... Um, experiencing the consequence of those evil actions, say drunkenness, drunk driving, is saying, perhaps, why are all these bad things happening? God is permitting that person to exist outside of his grace, permitting them to exist while they continually do those things while he's providentially working such that an individual may be brought across their path to say something that will somehow get them to reconsider their, their state in life. Does that so it makes sense. Right. Right. Yes. 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 Well, that's happening while he's permitting you to exist in this fallen state. And while you're there, perpetrate crimes against sometimes his people. Yeah. Yeah. Think about a doctor who says, I have no idea why this happened. This, this should have never happened mm -hmm. based on the thousand other times I've seen this. You know, this shouldn't have happened. 
I don't know how God works providentially. He might work too. You know, if, if he overrides nature in any way that would have happened otherwise, to me that's, you could call that a miracle. We just can't know how God right. works. Yes, and I think, I'm just telling you what a lot of the people that study this say, but at the end of the day, I, my kind of, like I said, rule of thumb is the, the atheist standing over there, what's he going to say? Does he, does he have another explanation for it or not? And in the providential case, the answer is yes. Right, in the miraculous case, the answer is no. Yeah. Right. Yes, that, 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 that's the key. But I, mm -hmm. I don't leave that open as a possibility. If God doing mm -hmm. it, I don't leave open the possibility that men today are doing supernatural things. Right, so you're saying you don't believe men are doing supernatural things today. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, very, very much so. But I think that, um, um, and, and I hope in the ideas that I've expressed is not to say that God is not powerfully working because just because he's not working miraculously, I'm certainly not trying to say he's not working very powerfully because we saw like in the case of Esther, there's a lot of players in place and it's doing, doing a great work on a national scale. So there, there, there's great power in that, but it's not like, you know, these are not the Jews you were looking for, you know, kind of thing. It was, it was working through, you know, you know. David, you had your hand raised. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I'm trying to think of the passage in uh, Acts chapter 4 when, uh, when the Sanhedrin has to say about the apostles uh, healing the man in the temple. They have to say that we cannot deny. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not, yeah, so it's beyond the objective third party. It's the hostile witness, you know. Like you said about, about Elijah's prayer, the person who's standing at a distance and doesn't know he's praying, he sees a cloud come, and there seems to come up over this door, yeah, yeah. and then it rains. Hey, it's on the rain. Yeah. They, didn't, they didn't know necessarily. Right, and I think, in, in my mind, the important thing is, it's because God desired it, willed it to happen. In this case, in response to prayer, right? But the, you know, objective third party or the, or the, the hostile witness would have another excuse. Another example I often think about, I think that we've mentioned before, is Lazarus. You know, to the point he's been dead four days, his body uh, had begun to decompose and stink. And in, when Jesus says, come forth, the Pharisees say, this is so undeniable. We cannot deny this thing. We've got to go kill him. Again, as if that's going to do any good, right? Um, but, but, you know, that's sort of the, the contrast. And, and maybe we're making too much of a point out of it, but my main thing is to say God works very powerfully today, and let's not neglect that wonderful blessing of prayer that we have. And just because we're not going to see Eddie go to the go to the morgue and raise people. And just because we're not going to have him bless the meatloaf and pass it around to everybody, that doesn't mean God doesn't work today. So let's make sure we benefit ourselves through asking for things appropriately according to God's will in prayer. You know, uh, in my situation, a third party would say, boy, that was just lucky. Wasn't that a great coincidence? Yeah, the, the other thing, um, and this may be making, making a mountain out of a molehill, but think about the instantaneous nature versus the, 
the uh, timely nature. So when you said that prayer, did boom, God zap a kayak on the sea, or did the guy wake up the, one morning and think, I'm going to take that kayak out there? During a storm. During a storm. Why would he do? You see what I mean? So if that, in fact, was God's providence working, it, God, God was working that, right, for a lot longer than you realized he was working that angle. <laughs> yeah, where was that kayaker? Yeah. 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 That's kind of a sore spot. Okay. Okay, so, so let's move on a little bit here. Um, we have been talking uh, for the most... Okay, okay, go, go ahead. Yeah, so what about, so, yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. So what about someone's free will when they die, right? My, my answer would be that God had granted, and it's kind of what I've been saying for a long time, God had granted them many, many years in which to exercise their free will. And he had brought across their paths, even at Sodom and Gomorrah, prophets to tell them what they needed to do. And they exercised their free will to either do it or not do it, right? But at some point, God's threshold is reached in, in terms of the sin of individuals and the sin of nations. And when that is up, you know, you have no excuse before God. He has given you. So if someone has a heart attack at age, you know, 55 or whatever. They had decades of time in which to turn to God. He offered them many chances, many opportunities. That goes back to his permissive will. He permitted them many, many years in which to uh, stay in a state of rebellion, to commit many rebellious acts against him and against his people. But God's uh, justice will not lay dormant forever. There is a day of reckoning. That's my thought. And that's all the more important for us to get our act together and realize that, you know, with all of it, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. And God gives us ample opportunity to turn to him, more so, I think, than we actually deserve, because he is a gracious God. Did that in any way answer your question, Kevin? Exactly. So as soon as that, once you sin, right, that's what you deserve, right? Mm -hmm. From that point on, it's permissive. Yeah. Uh, God is permitting mm -hmm. opportunity. Yeah, and, and we, we, I tried to make that point a little bit um, a few classes ago that really this whole idea of permissive will really only exists in the context of grace. Because after your initial sin, God doesn't owe you anything after that. Anything else is grace that he's allowing you an opportunity to turn to him.
Oh. Thank you, David. All right, any other questions on that? Yes. Yeah, so, so he said that, off, that if God is all-knowing, then he would know if someone is never going to choose to repent. That's a perfectly valid point. And I think also that any, at least the way I view it, any day, any additional day that I am granted to do something in this life is a gift from God. Any additional week, any additional month, any, God doesn't owe me. 110 years of life. You know, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't owe me that. He's not compelled to give that to me. I didn't earn it. The first time I sinned, I earned death. Anything after that is really God's grace expressed toward me, which helps me be extremely appreciative and helps me to humble myself in his sight, knowing that great gift, especially Christ, that is the solution for this sin problem after we sin. All right, any other, any other thoughts? Well, Charles, is, is a, to me, this, that's the hardest thing to, to reason about, right? If God knows something's going to happen, you talk about the permissive being God's grace, okay? God doesn't extend grace to, to someone he knows is going to be lost. I mean, why would he extend grace? What would that, what would that grace be for? Is it really grace to extend something where he knows that person's going to be lost? That's what, to me, is the hardest thing to understand about all of this. It's like, God knows, if God knows what's going to happen, and he allows himself to know what's going to happen, then why don't just zap everybody that's, that's not going to be saved? You know what I mean? What, yeah. what, what is it doing to allow that to happen? What is it doing to allow that person to sin and, and bring hardship on, on other people when he knows that person's going to be lost? All right. Um. <laughs> We may partly answer that in the next direction I want to go. But, but I think in, in one thing that we see that God tends to use people, even providentially, in their choice to do evil. God is still capable of using that person for good. Um, a classic example would be, say, Joseph's brothers. They decided, we're going to kill that dreamer. Right? We're, we're going to exercise our free will and kill that guy. Well, one of the brothers kind of gets to thinking about that and decides, well, why don't we sell him and make some money? So they sell another bad thing. And you follow the life of Joseph. Joseph, a lot of bad people did a lot of bad things to Joseph. Joseph ends up saving not only the Israelite nation, but that entire area of the Middle East from famine. Joseph looks back on it and says, you guys... You think I want to kill you? You don't understand. You intended all these things for my harm. God was using you for good. So that is a partial, maybe a small part, answer to your question that in that story and a number of other stories, God is actually through people's wrong choices and they are sinning and trying to do bad things, he is using them to accomplish his purpose. So, Yeah, yeah. You know, the more robotic the good guy is, the less value to me, the less yeah. love, actual, genuine love back to me that I do. Mm -hmm. That's a different reason for permissiveness and grace to the person that's actually doing the evil and God knows it's going to be lost. Well, I, I think it's both in the sense that because God doesn't just zap them dead, right. he affords them the opportunity to turn to him so that when we all stand before the judgment throne of God, those people are not going to be able to say, well, you just didn't give me a chance. If you'd just given me a chance, I really would have done right. 
that excuse is eliminated, that the extra time that they have is, is really, in my, in my view, a, a, an expression of grace, and that I gave you this time. I allowed you to make these mistakes. You should have been able to learn from those sins. You should have turned to me, but you didn't. And all the time that you weren't turning to me, I'm still able to use you for the benefit of people that will turn to me. Another example of that is um, the uh, crucifixion of Jesus. You know, in Acts chapter 2, doesn't Peter say that, you know, this was planned by God's determined purpose, and you guys, you crucified him, right? But without that crucifixion, where would we be? And he used it for his good. But I think, you know, in answer to Dean's question, one, myself, and, and, and there are probably people a lot smarter than me that may be able to answer your question, but I think there are a lot of things in this, in this arena that we're not going to fully appreciate or fully understand, perhaps until we get to heaven someday, that God's ways and his workings throughout time and through all people are pretty profound. For example, in the, in the story of Esther that, that we saw, there were a lot of people used in a lot of different ways. And the reason we know it is because it's revealed to us. Had it not been revealed to us, it would, at least for me, certainly not been so obvious. So in answer to your question, I don't know that we're going to know all of those reasons. I'm just suggesting a few possibilities. One is because God is good. So the example in Matthew chapter 5 is Jesus says, God gives blessings to all people, the good and the bad. He sends the rain on the just and the unjust and uh, the sun on the good and the evil just because he's good. He doesn't have to. He's not required to. That's just his nature, to be good. And so I'm suggesting that one of the reasons that people that even if God knows they're never going to uh, never going to turn to him, he's still going to send them rain and he's still going to send them sun just because he is by nature good. He gives them time to repent, I think, just my opinion, just because he's good. Also in that time, I think more importantly to Kevin's point, that he uses them providentially for the benefit of his people. And we see that over and over again in the scriptures. Are there other reasons that we don't know? Probably a lot that are beyond me to answer and understand. So I, I don't think I can ever fully answer that, that question, Dean. Uh, David, did you have something you want to say? <laughs> 
Yeah. I think we probably have to admit, too, we're probably not going to understand everything in this arena. All we can do is look at what the scriptures tell us and try to reason from that. And, and I think in many cases we can draw a number of conclusions, but we're not really going to understand everything, as frustrating as that can be to I don't know, people like me. I kind of like to know and want to know, but you just got to admit we're never going to know all of God's purposes. Okay, I had intended to go next into the story of Job, just as uh, you had suggested, because that's, I think, where all this is really leading and gives us some very interesting insights into what's going on, but we'll leave that to next week. Do what? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You got any more stories for us, Kevin? All right. Thank you very much.